I just can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It would be sad if it was the other way. There are so many people to thank for getting us all outside and at worship today. And I'm afraid I'm going to forget some, but I'm going to make the attempt. Uh, thank you to John Woodward, who made these beautiful offering boxes for us. These, yeah. These are um, actually what we used. I don't know about this particular church. This is what uh, churches in general used before we had these offering plates that we passed. So for centuries, these would be at the entrance of every church, and you just dropped in your offering that way. And, and you know, eventually we got to where we passed plates in the service. We're not passing anything right now. Um, so in an attempt to keep everybody distant and, and safe, at some point when you come or when you leave, if you have an offering you want to share, uh, just drop it in those boxes, one of those boxes. And that's how we're going to do that. Uh, Mo is responsible for these beautiful flowers. Uh, and I believe the cooks donated some of the flowers. So thank you to Mo. Thank you to the whole session and especially the worship, worship committee who spent a lot of time thinking about how we were going to do this in a safe way. Um, thank you to our musicians, uh, Frank and Lisa, who uh, have been just champions doing this outside. Uh, Frank with guitar and Lisa will sing. Uh, and we're using the PA system that Koi Slate gave us. And uh, Jim and Frank put it together so we could, could use it this morning. Uh, so thanks to the Slate family. Does anybody know somebody I've forgotten? Yeah, we, we do. Uh, we are grateful to the Lord for the weather because earlier this week it said it was going to rain this morning. So, <laughs> still might. Well, if it does rain, just so you know, we, there's no practical way in our building for us to keep separate. So if it is raining, we just revert to online worship. That's the rain plan. Let's see. Announcements are the most scary part because I always forget something I need to say but I can't think of anything else. Can anybody else think of something we need to know? Let's begin our worship this morning or continue it. Uh, I will say this is the day the Lord has made and you all will respond, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful after 16 long weeks to be gathered again for worship on the Lord's Day. We praise you for the good weather. We praise you for the gift of each other. And we ask that as we gather, we would also be hungry for your word and your presence as we are hungry for each other's. Grant that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, as you have promised to all who love you, so that what we do may be pleasing to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we don't have bulletins, we're going to be doing some things differently this morning. We're going to move uh, into a time of confession and assurance of pardon. And how this will work is that we're going to be silent for a while. Um, and each of us confess to the Lord, and then I will pray uh, on behalf of all of us. The scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's been a long time since we've been gathered to hear the words of assurance, even though we know that we don't have to confess together to receive them. We know that our Lord is gracious and merciful and quick to forgive. So in the silence of our hearts, let us confess our sins against God and one another.
Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to the world in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And be at peace. We'll have a hymn now. We ask that you don't sing the hymn, but please uh, attend to the words in your mind as if you were singing. You're welcome to hum from behind your mask. Whatever, uh, you can clap if you want. Whatever makes you feel uh, most involved with it. To hear the scriptures read, let's pray. 
loving God, you've made us so that we cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. Give us this morning a hunger for those words and satisfy us with that food. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning, uh, we're still going through Acts, and we are going to read Acts chapter 4, verse 32, through Acts chapter 5, verse 10. I've told you before, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you need to ignore the chapter markings because they will occasionally lead you astray. And that uh, is the case this morning. So hear the word of the Lord. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. With his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And a great fear seized all who heard of it. The young men came and wrapped up his body, and then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, Yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. We've heard this before, right? Our text this morning starts off in a familiar place. We're painted a picture, again, of a loving community's concern for its less fortunate members, which took the Um, form of people sharing what they had. Sometimes, we're told, people who had extra property went so far as to sell it and bring the money to the disciples who oversee a distribution program. If anybody needs something, they get it. And we're told that the system works so well that there's not a single needy person among them. One of the generous people who were selling their stuff and giving the money to the apostles to distribute was named Joseph, which, like it is today, maybe more so than it is today, is a really common name. When I was in school, I bet it was the same when you're in school. There's like six Johns in a class, or six Davids, 
And the first week of school involved everybody figuring out variations. So people knew what you were talking about. So someone was John. I bet this was the experience of some of you all. Someone was John, and someone was Johnny, and someone was like John David or something, John Andrew, with the middle name. That's the situation here. There's too many Josephs running around. So the apostles give him a nickname, Barnabas, son of encouragement. Bar just means son of, and then whatever comes next, right? Son of encouragement. That gives us a glimpse into his character. He sells a field, brings the money, lays it at the apostles' feet. It's an impressive gift. And Ananias and Sapphira, they decide they want to be impressive too. So they take their property and sell it, but they don't bring all the money to the apostles, only some of it. To be fair to them, at first, they don't claim that is all of the money, but that's what they want people to think. They lie by omission. And then by explicitly what they say, and they both fall down and are carried out and buried. So, welcome back to church, I guess. What a text. You'll note that the donation boxes are over here. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This story involves money, but it's not about money. It's certainly not about God killing you if you don't give enough money to the church, or even if you don't give all the money you have to the church. It's about cynicism that slowly creeps in and calcifies your heart and your relationships. It'll kill you if you let it. It's poison. But that's not how it starts out. If it started out as poison, nobody would be tempted by it. Cynicism is tempting because at least at first, it promises to keep us safe. Ananias and Sapphira want the benefits of this dramatic full commitment to the fledgling church, but they're worried the cost might be too high. Humans are humans, even when they're ancient humans. Barnabas made an impressive gift. It spoke well of his character. It made people admire him. It got him in the Bible. They want that too. And not to be too hard on them, they probably believed in the cause as well. They probably wanted to care for the, pure, the poor. But there was something that kept them back from giving away everything. Maybe they wanted to be able to take care of themselves if this whole thing went wrong. Maybe they just weren't willing to be quite that generous. But they go in and lay some of the money at the apostles' feet. Because if they can pretend, then they get the admiration and acceptance of the community anyway. They get to be like Barnabas with a little set aside just in case. And I don't know about you, but I can sympathize with that. There's a reason that we're taught to be careful when we join new groups. There's a reason that our radio is so dominated with songs about heartbreak. We all need loving communities, loving relationships to be happy and healthy. We need our friends, our family, our community. As we've experienced all too clearly in the last several months. If we don't have those things, we get lonely and depressed. We can't flourish. But the problem is that loving people and being loved by them is dangerous because there's always the possibility that it's going to go badly. There's always the possibility, as happens all too often, that the relationship will break and the backlash is going to hurt us. And that's where the temptation to cynicism creeps in. And it promises us that if we learn to view our relationship cynically, we can put in less than the other person is putting in, less than they think we're putting in. 
We can keep a little bit of space for ourselves. What they don't know won't hurt them, right? We're protected from pain and heartbreak. If the worst happens, there's a cushion between us and the explosion. Perfect. That's what Ananias and Sapphira do. Notice Peter's analysis of the situation. The issue isn't about the money. It's that they lied about it. Ananias, by omission, Sapphira, when asked directly, lies directly. The money, Peter says, was theirs to do what they want with, before and after the sale. They could have kept it or given it away and been innocent, either way. The issue comes when they lie about it, when cynicism comes between them and their brothers and sisters in the faith, between them and their God. Cynicism promises to protect us from pain if things go sideways. But what it really does is keep us from love. The cushion that numbs the pain will numb the relationship. The fully safe heart is a dead heart. The process is accelerated with Ananias and Sapphira, but it's true for all of us. That's not the way that God in Christ loves us. He loves us without reservation, without holding any part of himself back. He's not waiting to see what will happen or making a plan B just in case you turn out not to be worth it. He's all in. That's part of what the incarnation means. And on the cross, he accepts the pain, the backlash that comes with that love with broken relationships. And on Easter morning, he proves that even that pain is not stronger than love is. That's the kind of love he calls us to as well. He wants our love back, not because he needs it to be whole. God doesn't need anything. But because we need it to be whole. Because any part of us we hold back has the potential to turn poisonous. And he calls us into that kind of relationship with one another, real relationships with nothing held back, based off the pattern of his relationship with us. And yeah, sometimes that'll involve money. But most of the time, it's just courage and the willingness to get hurt the desire to see the other person in all created. That kind of love has the power to remake the world. And in fact, it's already started. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. If you know it, please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we move into a time of prayer for ourselves and the world, I want to let you know that Ronnie Billings is home after his stint uh, in the hospital um, after breaking his hip. On Thursday afternoon, he had surgery Thursday evening, was in the hospital, uh, but came home yesterday and is doing well. 
Let's pray. O Lord, who made the whole world and delights in it, every blade of grass, every human soul, we give you thanks with all our hearts that you have permitted us to gather this morning together. And we pray for the world you created as every country deals with the effects of this pandemic, that you would give everyone wisdom and courage and love to handle themselves and their nation in the wisest and most loving way. As we give thanks for the gathering of our congregation, we pray for the whole church especially in places where it suffers, where it is persecuted, we ask that you give courage and favor in the eyes of their government, and that as it has always been, the blood of the martyrs would be the seed of the church. And Lord, I don't know how many churches are feeling complacent right now, But whatever shreds of complacency cling to us, we ask that you would free it, free us from it, that you would give us imagination and creativity and courage to find new ways of being church in a new and different world, that we would not be so caught up in what we have been that we lose sight of who we are and who we will be. And I pray for our country, for the United States, for all of our leaders, from our local leaders to our national leaders, for our judges, for our courts, for our universities, for all the institutions that make us who we are, that all those who lead and enforce and form our laws and our culture would be guided by your wisdom. And we pray especially this morning for the sick, for the lonely, for the dying, for the grieving. We ask that you would be the healer and the hope and the light and the joy of all. We ask these things through Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite our musicians back up for our closing hymn.
Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you all, now and forever. Amen. I'm not going to tell you all to leave immediately and not socialize, but please do uh, remember your masks and remember to keep some space. We don't want to be the next people on the news. Also, if you have not signed in, please do. Uh, it helps us a lot with planning, and it also helps us, if something should happen, to get in contact with you all. And these are the offering boxes that John made. And I think that's all I have to say. Go in peace. <laughs>